Morning, church. Um, I think everybody probably knows me. For those that don't, I'm Nick Judd. I'm the kids pastor here. I have the, uh, the privilege of overseeing all of our ministries for birth through fifth grade and creating the curriculum and discipleship materials so that our kids can uh, hopefully grow up with a Christian worldview and be able to see the world through the lens of God's word. I um, also have the great honor of working alongside Lori DeSico, our kids' ministry director, and a team of incredible volunteers. And I wanted to make sure while I had this opportunity up here towards the end of the year to acknowledge them and to show my gratitude for this team of volunteers. Uh, they, they work tirelessly week in and week out to show Christ to these kids and to try to teach them to love God's word and to know God's word and how to defend God's word and how to put their trust in God's word. I did a little bit of loose math coming upon the end of this year and, uh, and I came up with uh, a startling number. Our kids curtain holders, the volunteers in, in our kids ministry, have given over 5,000 hours this year alone to serving these kids. Can we give them a hand for that? Yeah, over 5,000 hours this year serving these kids. Um, I, I, I could not be more grateful for them and I hope that they know that, I hope that you know that. Um, but in light of that, you may have noticed that the next three services are gonna be a little bit different than normal. Uh, tonight, the worship night, and then Christmas Eve, and then Christmas morning are all going to be family style only, which is even a little bit different than our normal family integrated worship. Everybody's going to be in here together. Uh, babies all the way up to, to the rest of us are all going to be in here together. And the reason behind that is, uh, what you may or may not know, is a lot of our kids' curtain holders not only serve weekly, but a lot of them serve uh, twice a week, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. And so what ends up happening is some of our most faithful and committed people end up missing out on the special events and the worship nights and the holiday services that we do. And so this year we just made a call and we said, you know what, we're just going to bring everybody in here together because we want to honor these people that are serving our families and make sure that they all get to be in here with us. So again, just a reminder for you, tonight, Christmas Eve and Christmas morning, family style only, we're all going to be in here together uh, as a way to honor these, these people that are serving our families so well. Uh, one last thing on kids ministry stuff, this Wednesday night, if you didn't see the video, at 5.30, we've got our kids Christmas play. Uh, so if you like the gospel and train wrecks, then you want to make sure that you're here for that, okay? Um, okay, so all that aside, we're back in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and get your Bibles ready, we're in verses 14 through 20. Genesis 3, 14 through 20. And while you're getting there, let me just go ahead and catch you up. Uh, two weeks ago, Larry did a fantastic job uh, just giving us the introduction of Satan into the garden the introduction of Satan into the Bible story of God's plan of redemption. And he, he showed us how he got there and why he was there and what he was doing. And ultimately, we kind of walked away with that sermon understanding that, um, that, that Satan is, is in the garden because he plays a part in God's story of redemption. He plays a part to, to glorify God and, and the story that God has written. And then last week, um, we, we had Morgan, who just did a really, really great job for us, walking us through uh, that first temptation and how Eve was deceived by the serpent into seeking to become like God and Adam and Eve sought to exalt themselves and, and the consequent sin and, and fall. And then we kind of ended it with Adam and Eve's response to God when God calls them to account and they give this lackluster confession and, and kind of pass the buck and shift the blame. And, and that's where we kind of wrapped up last week. And so that brings us to where we are today where we get to see God's response to uh, Adam and Eve's sin. We get to see the, the results of what happened in the garden. Uh, results that affect each and every one of us every single day, whether we realize it or not. Uh, so if you would, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's word, and we're going to dive right into this. Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 14. God's word says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Go ahead and pray for us one more time as we get started this morning. Father, just thank you again for, for your word, once again. Lord, we just acknowledge that you don't have to reveal anything to us. You don't have to reveal yourself to us. You don't have to reveal your plan of salvation to us, and yet you do. 
in your kindness and in your mercy, Lord, you see fit to, uh, to reach out to us, to seek us. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. I thank you for this time to be able to be with your family. Uh, I pray that as I, I bring the word to them, that you would speak through me, that you would cause your son to be lifted up, that you would cause your truth to be received. And Lord, more than anything, I pray that we would all leave here this morning loving your son more than what we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So this November, I, uh, I celebrated 20 years of walking with the Lord. I came to faith. At, yeah, well, that's not. Yeah, thank him for putting up with me. Um, but, but uh, you know, I came to faith as a young adult and um, not really any church background or Bible experience. And so everything was a first for me. Uh, the first time I read the Bible, it was new to me. The first time that, uh, that I heard sermons, it was new to me. It was all the first time I sang worship songs, it was new to me. And, um, and the Lord was just so gracious to, to just begin teaching me and giving me a hunger for his word. And, uh, and, and really, uh, you know, he has, he's put up with a whole lot in the last 20 years. And, uh, and if, if we could be forsaken by God, I, I would have been forsaken in the last 20 years. But, but praise God, that's just not who he is. Um, but also in that 20 years, there's, there's several things that he has taught me along the way that are these repeating lessons. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys can relate to this, but there are certain things that the Lord just has to bring back to mind in my life over and over and over again. And it's one of those things where, where, where once the Lord kind of hits me upside the head with it, I'm like, man, I thought I learned that like years ago. And one of those repeating lessons that the Lord teaches me over and over again is that he absolutely refuses to let us put him in a box. And as cliche as that sounds, let me explain what I mean by that. Anytime that we try, to, um, we try to draw tight lines around the character or the workings of God uh, in an effort to make ourselves feel comfortable, he'll defy it every time. And, and you know, we all desire a, a picture of God who is nice and neat and predictable, um, that, that doesn't really mess up our plans very much, that doesn't really mess up our theology very much, and he'll just defy that every time. And an example of this is there's a really popular brand of Christianity, and it's not anything new. It just kind of gets a makeover every so many years. But there's a really popular brand of Christianity right now that likes to say things like, Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors, and Jesus fought for the oppressed, and Jesus welcomed the outcasts. And of course, all those things are true in as much as they're said in balance and in context. But typically, when, when, those, when those things are heralded, the, the attempt that's being made there is this attempt to bring God down low. To bring God, to, to remove his transcendence and remove his holiness and remove his righteousness and bring him down to a level that's okay uh, with, with our lack of holiness, that's okay with our lack of righteousness. But then on the other side, uh, the, in the other ditch, you know I can't give a sermon without the two ditch analogies. In the other ditch, we, we've got the idea that God is, God is holy and God is righteous and God is just and God, God pours out his wrath on wickedness and all of those things are true as well. But the thing is, while both of those ideas hold truth, neither one of them are true without the other. Because, you see, he's always the lion and the lamb. He's never the lion or the lamb. He's, he's always gracious and compassionate, abounding in loving kindness, but he's always righteous and just, and he will pour out his wrath on the wicked. He's always both at the same time. Uh, matter of fact, Isaiah 57, uh, 15 says... For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place and also with him who is contrite and lowly of spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And then in Exodus 34, verses 5 through 7, you remember the, the, the common passage where Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory. And what the Lord says, uh, this is just an interesting side note, what the Lord says is, is he says, Moses, you can't see my face, you'll see me from behind, I'll hide you in the rock, you guys are familiar with this. But what he says is, is I will cause my goodness to pass before you, and I'll proclaim my name to you. And so when the Lord proclaims his name to Moses, this is what he says. He says, the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. It's always both and. He's always righteous and just and holy and exalted and lifted up and transcendent, but he's always 
merciful and gracious and compassionate. And he's not these things because of what he does. You see, God isn't merciful because he shows mercy. He shows mercy because he is merciful. He is merciful in nature. God isn't just because he exercises justice. He exercises justice because he is just. This is who he is. In Romans eleven twenty two, which is really the heartbeat behind the, the sermon that I have for you this morning. Romans eleven twenty two, Paul says this, um, this interesting phrase. He says, behold the kindness and severity of God. Behold the kindness and severity of God. I bring this up because both of these things are in our passage today. We're going we're gonna to look at God's justice against sin after Adam and Eve fall. And we're going to look at the effects that that has on the, on the world that we live in today and on ourselves. And this passage is heavy on judgment. This is a passage about judgment. This is the first judgment that God exercises in the history of creation. But I want you to see that it's laced with mercy. And, and that it's not just that mercy's hiding in there in a shadow, but mercy is actually on display in this passage, but oftentimes we don't see it. And it's not that we don't see it because it's not clear. We don't see it because we don't have the eyes to see it. We don't have the right, we don't understand, we don't understand this. When, when you read this book, uh, this is not just a description of what God has done. You, you understand, when we say that this is inspired by God, what we're saying is that he wrote the story. And not only did he wrote the story, he chose how the story was written. And so when we look at Genesis chapter 3 and we see that Adam and Eve had, had perfection at their fingertips, and they, they gave it away for autonomy. They gave it away in order to try to rule over themselves. And the, the consequent fall and judgment that comes after that doesn't have any gap between that and the promise of redemption. What I want you to see this morning is that in the third chapter of the book, the third chapter of the story of redemption, the gospel is presented So often we think that the gospel is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We we think that the Old Testament is law and judgment and wrath and that the New Testament is grace and mercy and love. But the gospel is in Genesis chapter 3. God wastes zero seconds from the time that sin enters the world to give the promise of redemption. And and this passage that we're looking at today could be broken down like this. It tells us three things. It tells us something about the world that we live in. It tells us something about ourselves And it tells us something about the God who has written the story. Something about the world we live in, something about ourselves, and something about God. And of course, what it tells us about the world is plain. If we've been in church for any amount of time, we're used to this. Genesis chapter 3 is about the fall, and it's about the the source of the sinful nature that all men have. It's about the source of of all the, the pain and death and calamity and disease in the world today. This is Somebody says, where did all this come from? We go to Genesis 3, and we say it's in the fall. When Adam and Eve fell, everything else is a consequence of that, and we understand that. So this is what it tells us about our world. And we can look at Genesis chapter 3, and we can draw a parallel line to Romans chapter 3, and we can say, but we're not any better than Adam and Eve. Morgan brought this up last week. We can't can't decry God's justice and say, well, it's not fair that we're being punished for that, because the Bible says that we're all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That none seek him. That there are none righteous. That we have all turned aside to our own way. And so we we can look at this and see what does this tell us about ourselves, that we're no better that the judgment that's being issued to Adam and Eve could have just as easily been, ju- been issued to me. But then most importantly, we look at this passage and we say, but what does this passage tell us about God? Because this is his story. And I think what he wants us to see more than anything, anytime that we're looking at his story, is what does it say about him? Because it's about him. And what this story tells us about him, what this passage tells us about him, is that even in his justice... He is so full of mercy that he promised redemption as soon as man fell. As soon as man fell. I want you to see this morning that what's revealed about the character of God in the third chapter of the book is that pain, that word's going to come up a lot in the judgment that he issues, that pain is introduced. But it's not introduced without the promise of redemption. And that says something about God. You know, when people get baptized here, we give them t-shirts that say, but God. Right? And, and the, the allusion there is to passages like Ephesians chapter 2 where it says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy. And, and the idea is that whenever God interjects himself or his truth or his promises or the gospel into a hopeless situation, everything changes. 
And of course, that's what baptism is a picture of. That's why we give them those t-shirts. Because the idea is when God steps in, everything changes. That, that this was horrible, this was bad, I was broken, I was lost, I was on the road to hell, but God. And what I have for you this morning is hopefully, um, hopefully an understanding that Genesis 3, particularly verse 15, is the first but God moment not only in the Bible, but in the history of creation. And that God brings it out in the introduction to the story. The gospel doesn't come in the, in the rising action. It doesn't come in the climax. It doesn't come in the falling action. The gospel shows up in the introduction to the story that God is telling about creation. Genesis 3.14 is where we're going to start. And what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the text. And, and we're going to land back on this idea that that God brings the promise of deliverance, the promise of redemption, the promise of hope right in with the fall. I've titled my message today, The Pain is Not Without a Promise. The Pain is Not Without a Promise. So with that, let's, let's dive right in. Genesis three fourteen. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now, people often speculate as to whether or not snakes had legs prior to the fall. And as fun as that speculation might be, uh, it's secondary to the point of this passage at best. Because what's really being communicated here is, is the judgment that God is giving to Satan, who is embodying the serpent or showing himself in the form of a serpent. And he's not, I mean, while that may have some relationship to the physical creature, that Satan was embodying, uh, God is not attempting to give us a, a biology lesson on the anatomy of snakes pre and post fall, right? So, so this, is, this is one of those things where don't, don't major on the minors. What's being communicated here, when he says, on, on, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life, this is a judgment of humiliation upon the fallen angel Satan. This creature who was once this beautiful, uh, splendid, powerful, majestic, majestic creature that, that tried to exalt himself, what God is doing here is what he says he always does, all through scripture. The one who exalts himself will be cast low, right? He, he gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. And that's exactly what's happening in this passage. God is, God is telling Satan, you, you, are, you are moving not only from this place of honor and this place of beauty uh, down to the earth, I'm not only casting you down to the earth, but you're gonna, you're gonna be brought so low that, that you're going you're gonna to be as low as the very ground that the creation that you have deceived walks on. He's, he's bringing Satan down low. He's, this is humiliation language. And then, of course, the second part of this where he says, uh, where, where he says that, um, that you are cursed above all other livestock and all, all of the beasts of the field. What we see here is something that we've, we've talked about before. That with Adam's fall, everything under Adam's care suffers the consequences. Um, some of you guys know that even though Brandon hates dogs, I, I really love animals. Um, and man, listen, I, I mean, I'll just be honest with you, it just, man, it just wrecks me, you know? Uh, driving, driving to the church this morning and just see another dead deer this time of year, um, and, and it just wrecks me. And every time I see things like I, I just think, these things were under Adam's care. These things were under Adam's care. And, and the reason why these things happen is because in God's justice, uh, he... he he judges in a form of what we call headship, that there are representatives. Adam was the representative of all that he was in charge of. The same way that, that in Christ, Christ is our representative. We enjoy righteousness that doesn't belong to us, righteousness that we didn't earn. We enjoy the favor of God that we didn't earn. We enjoy the, being able to walk into the presence of the Father that we don't deserve. And we, we, we have all of that because somebody else earned it for us. Because our representative, Christ, earned it for us. And that when we put our faith in him, we're joined to that. Well, the same thing works the other way. In Adam, death and disease, and destruction, all come to those who are in Adam's care. That's what we're all born into prior to being born again into Christ. And so what we see is that Satan is, is being cursed above all the other livestock and beasts of the field because he is an utter, um, a source of utter disdain and, and repulsion to creation. This is his judgment. For exalting himself, he's cast down low. And flip over to Romans 8. Morgan referenced this last week, but I, I want to I drive this point home a little bit before we go any further. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 19. Romans chapter 8, verse 19. It says, For the creation waits 
with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This passage tells us that creation is broken. All of creation is broken. But it also tells us why creation is broken. It says that it was, it was subjected to futility and corruption. What we need to catch is it tells us who subjected it to futility and corruption. God subjected it to futility and corruption. You see, sometimes we'll use the phrase like uh, something bad will happen and we'll, we'll talk to somebody and try to encourage them and say, well, well, we live in a fallen world, right? And that's a true phrase, but a lot of times we'll use that phrase to try to sanitize the, the reality. We'll try to soften the blow that the world isn't just fallen in some passive sense. There wasn't some magic that happened when, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit that all of a sudden the, the, all the ground started getting darker. and It wasn't some magical thing. The, the world is fallen and broken because it's under the judgment of God. You see, we walk around every single day in a world that is under the active, present judgment of God because of what happened here in the garden. Because this was the consequence of mankind's fall. And, and the promise in Christ is that you're, you get released from that judgment. You get born into a new kingdom. This is, this is one of the promises of the gospel. But what I want us to see here, Romans 1.18, and you don't have to flip there, but Romans 1.18 says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven on all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And the interesting thing about that verse is that the word revealed there is an active, ongoing tense. And what that means is it could be better rendered, the wrath of God is constantly being revealed. Why is it constantly being revealed? Because we live in a world that is under the judgment of God. Why do these things happen? Why, why, why is all the pain and disease and death? Because the world is not only fallen and broken, but the world is under judgment. It's under the judgment of Genesis chapter 3. In other words, this world has not fallen just in a sense that it happens to be broken. It's fallen in the sense that we live in, the world, in a world under the active judgment of God. And this is partly what Jesus meant in John chapter 3 when he said, he who doesn't believe is condemned already. In Ephesians 2, 3 that, that I mentioned earlier where Paul says, Paul says that you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Why is that? Because the world is already under judgment. Jesus comes to release you from that judgment. But fortunately, thank God, that's not the last word. Verse 15, I don't know if you noticed it, it was in the song we sang this morning. Verse 15, the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This word offspring here, you've probably also seen it or heard it translated as seed. And this word bruised as crushed. W.A. Criswell, theologian, said, Many Christian commentators since the second century have called this the Proto-Evangelium, which is just a $5 word that means the first preaching of the gospel. The first preaching of the gospel. This is the Bible in embryo, the sum of all history and prophecy in a germ, he says. And what's happening here is God is, God is giving a prophecy of, of further judgment to the serpent. And, and he says, because you have done this, not only... Uh, not only will you be a source of disdain, not only will you be a source of disgust, not only will you be humiliated and cast down, but because you have done this, Satan, your days are numbered. You are, you are now living on a clock. And the end of you will not only come from me, God says, but it will come from the seed of the very one that you deceived. The seed of the woman, of course, referring to Jesus. Jesus is the one that comes to crush the serpent's head. And, and the way that he crushes the serpent's head is in his death and resurrection and final judgment when he will cast Satan into the lake of fire. And of course, the way that Satan bruises his heel is the, the pain inflicted to Christ at the resurrection. Um, Hebrews 2.14 says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself, Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Let me me restate that for you uh, in a lyric to a song that we just sung a moment ago. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. 
This is Genesis 3.15. The, the power that Satan holds over those who are in Adam, which is all of us prior to coming to Christ. The power that Satan holds over us is death. Why is the power he holds over us death? Well, because Romans says that the wages of sin is death. And Ezekiel says that the, the soul that sins must die. And so the power that is held over us is death, spiritual, eternal, physical death. And the reason why Satan holds that power is because he's the accuser that accuses us day and night. That he is the one who, who brings the prosecuting charges against us. And the way that Christ releases us from that power of sin and that power of death is by tasting death on our behalf. Listen, this isn't that complicated. Sometimes we make the gospel way more complicated than it needs to be. If the wages of my sin is death, physical, spiritual, eternal death, if, if that's what I have earned with my sin, and I surely have, and Christ who has never sinned, the perfect Adam, the one that comes in for the redo, the, the perfect Adam comes in and he never sins and yet he goes to death and he, and he says that death is on my behalf, then how much death is there left for me? There's none. There's none. And so he crushes the serpent's head in what the serpent thinks is an injury to him at the cross. He crushes the serpent's head and not only does he do that, but he does it for real people. He doesn't just, just do it to show something. He does it to achieve something, to accomplish something. And the thing that he's accomplishing is the fulfillment of the promise of Genesis 3.15. Christ came into the world to die. And he came into the world to die in order that he might set his people free and crush the serpent's head. The gospel is in Genesis 3.15. We're going to come back to this, but I want you to notice the order and what's going on. So first of all, God is going to issue the judgments on these three parties, Satan, Eve, and Adam, in the order of the offenses. So, so Satan was the first to sin in tempting Eve, so he gets the first judgment. Eve is then deceived by Satan, so she gets the second. And then Adam takes and eats based on Eve's um, uh, giving the fruit to him. He's judged third. But what I want you to see is God goes straight to Satan, and then before he ever issues the judgment on mankind... He gives the promise of redemption. Listen, he gives the promise of redemption before the judgment. This says something. This says something about him. We're in the introduction to the story, and creation has just been broken. God has just been sinned against by, by people who he gave everything to, and before he issues their judgment to them, he stops and gives them a promise. What does this say about God? Behold the kindness and severity of God. Romans eleven twenty two 22 says. A.W. Pink paraphrased it like this. He said, here again we behold the exceeding riches of God's grace. God's grace. We're reading a passage on judgment. And A.W. Pink says, we're seeing the exceeding riches of God's grace here in Genesis chapter 3. In the fall. In the judgment of mankind. In the, in the, in the death and destruction and pain and suffering that we all go through. A.W. Pink is saying, this is because of God's grace. Before he acted in judgment, he displayed mercy. Before he banished the guilty ones from Eden, he gave them a blessed promise and hope. And here it is. Here's the hope. By woman had come sin. And by woman should come the Savior. By woman had come the curse. And by woman should come the one who would bear and remove the curse. By woman, paradise was lost. Yet by woman should be born the one who should regain it. The promise came before the judgment. And yet, still sin has a cost. The kindness and severity of God, right? So then he turns to Eve, and we begin to see how this plays out. Verse 16, he says to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but let's look at the, the second judgment first. Uh, on YouTube, you can go back and find it. We did a sermon on Genesis chapter 2. We talked about the structure and order of marriage from Genesis 2 and Ephesians chapter 5. And what we brought out from that, that passage, those two passages, is that God had a design in marriage, and it was for, for the man to lead in the home, self-sacrificially, laying down his life, nourishing and cherishing his wife, being Christ to his wife, and for the wife to, uh, to, to, to lovingly and trustingly follow and help and support and counsel. And, and, that, and that when these roles are fulfilled, both are equal in dignity, value, and worth, but when these two roles are fulfilled, that marriage functions in the way that God designed it to function. And in a room this size, statistically, there's people who don't like what I just said. Again, here's some irony. 
the reason why you don't like what I just said is because of Genesis chapter 3. You see, because Adam and Eve didn't have any problem with that structure. But we have a problem with that structure. Why do we have a problem with that structure? Because of Genesis chapter 3. Because he said, your desire will be contrary to your husband and he shall rule over you. You see, the, this judgment that's being pronounced on Adam and Eve, is, or on Eve particularly, is being pronounced on the foundational building block of the society that God commanded them to create. The, the, the being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth and subduing it, all of that was contingent upon this one institution that God created, the first institution that he created, which was marriage, that was the union between, uh, between two complementary parts to glorify him. And, and what he says is, what you've done, Eve, is now going to cause a fracture in that most foundational institution. And then he also says that she will now have pain in childbearing. And the question that I want to answer is, a fracture in, in the marriage relationship, a fracture between man and woman and the way that they relate to one another, and pain in childbearing, why are these the two judgments that's being issued on Eve? He could have given her any judgment, could have given her any penalty, any punishment, but it's a fracture in the marriage relationship and pain in childbearing. And we find our answer if we look down a little bit further and see the judgment that's given to Adam. He tells Adam that the ground is cursed because of him and that thorns and thistles will it produce and that, and that by the sweat of his brow will he bring forth the provision through which he is to provide for his wife. And so the things that are being cursed here, this is interesting, are the very means by which they were to fulfill the calling that God had given them originally. See, Genesis chapter 1, 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then in 2.15, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And so we see being fruitful and multiplying. This was, this was part of their original vocation. By the way, when somebody says, you know, why are we here? Why did God create people? What's the purpose of mankind? And the nice good Baptist answer is God created people to have a relationship with him. And, and while that's true, it's, it's not the whole truth. Mankind has a vocation. We have a calling. We have a purpose that God gave us. It's being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth with God-fearers, filling the earth with people that will glorify God. This was the original creation mandate, and it's never been rescinded. But what he says is, is here's your calling, Adam and Eve. Be fruitful and multiply. And then they sin. And he said, now that will be done in pain. He says, fill the earth and subdue it. And now the marriage relationship, that institution that is necessary for that to happen, will now be done in pain. He says to, to work the garden, to work the ground and keep it and bring forth produce from creation, to be a creator. He says, now that will be done in pain. And so the very things that were cursed were the, were the means by which they were to fulfill their calling. But don't miss this. God said that the consequence of their sin is that in the day that they sin, they will surely die. And yet, Adam and Eve are going to live for hundreds more years. And in bringing pain to the means by which they're to fulfill their calling, we need to notice that he didn't rescind the calling. You see, he could have killed them right then and be perfectly just to do so. But not only does he let them live, he lets them keep their calling. He lets them keep their vocation. He lets them keep their purpose. Redemption is all over the judgment of God in Genesis chapter 3. He lets them keep their calling. This is the fall. This is the, the root of all the pain and suffering and sorrow that we see in the world. And the last thing that we see in this is Adam's uh, verse, the end of verse 19, Adam's final judgment where he says, uh, where he says, till, till, the, uh, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What does this have to do with? Well, if we think back to what happened to the serpent, it's the same thing. This is humiliation language, but it's really specific, you see, because Adam was made in the image of God. Adam was meant to be uh, an object of God's glory, and he was meant to live forever. He was meant to be an object of glory, and he was meant to live forever. And now God says, dust, you'll be an object of shame, and you'll return to the ground. Now your days will be fleeting. This is, the, this is the fall. This is what sin brought in Genesis chapter 3. But God is good, and he doesn't tell stories with bad endings. I want you to, to put this all together and see the heart and the character of God in this passage. Adam and Eve... They were, they were given the promise before they were given the punishment. They were given the promise of redemption, and not only the promise of redemption, but promise of redemption that would come through the very one who initiated the fall. 
that it would be from her seed, which by the way is an allusion to the virgin birth because all over scripture, the seed is always attributed to the man, never to the woman. This is, this is an illusion. This is, Christ is hiding right there in that passage and as God is magnifying his glory. And not only does he promise redemption, but then he gives them temporary, temporal mercy as well. He lets them continue to live and he lets them continue to fulfill their vocation that he has for them. And here's a, here's a really, really, really big spotlight on God's mercy in verse 20, our last verse. Doesn't this seem a little bit out of place where it says, and, and he, he named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all living. Doesn't that seem a little bit out of, it, it feels abrupt. So when you go back to the, to the entire passage, and we go from, um, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. How in the world does that fit into this passage? Here's what I want to show you. Another one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. God commands Abraham to take Isaac up the mountain. You've probably heard me say this before. And as Abraham doesn't know what God's going to do, he just knows that he's promised this son to him, that he loves this son with all of his heart, and now God's commanded him to kill the son. And Abraham is standing at the base of the mountain, and he looks at his, serp- his, uh, his servants, and he tells the servants, wait here, the boy and I will go up and worship, and we will return to you. And this is, this is what Adam's doing here. However this judgment went, whatever the tone and posture and disposition of God in his issuing of this judgment to Adam and Eve, however that sounded, God wa- or Adam walked away from that judgment still with enough hope in the mercy of God to look at Eve and say, we've just brought death. We've just ruined everything. We've just destroyed the world. And yet Eve, I'm calling you Eve because you will be the mother of all living. This is faith in the mercy of God. Even when Adam surely had no idea how God was going to pull it off. He, he comes out of the judgment of death and, and calls his wife Eve because she will be the mother of all living. This is the mercy of God in Genesis chapter 3. Behold the kindness and severity of God. The prophet Habakkuk in um, Habakkuk 3 verse 2 says a curious phrase that aligns with this. He says, in wrath, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. Where, where would he come up with an idea like this? This is, this is counterintuitive. In wrath, remember mercy. Because Habakkuk knew the Lord. Because he knew the character of God. In wrath, remember mercy. We find the gospel not only in the introduction to the story, but we find it right on the heels of the fall. And we find it being presented before the punishment is presented. God, even in his justice, is so full of mercy that he promised redemption as soon as man fell. I've mentioned Ephesians chapter 2 several times, but let me just read some of it to you. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who is now work in the sons of disobedience. That's the same Satan that we see in the garden. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. We see that's, there's a parallel there from the fall. By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The promise of Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled in Ephesians 2, 1 through 5. The, the promised one, the seed of the woman, came and crushed the serpent's head. Mercy triumphed, and it was to f- fulfill the promise that's introdu- introduced to us in the very beginning of, of the Bible. This is the mercy of God. Let me give you, throw a few more verses at you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's 1 Peter 1.3. Psalm 103 verse 10. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. Isn't that true? Don't we see that in the garden? He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. Lamentations 3.33 says the Lord does not afflict from his heart or willingly grieve the children of men. And of course, Jonah 4.10 through 11. You remember the story? Jonah didn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites because he didn't want them to repent. 
And the Lord says to Jonah, uh, after Jonah complains about the, 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 the plant that withered that he was sitting under, he says, you, you pity the plant, Jonah, for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. Here's what the Lord says. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. What I want you to see is that the mercy of God does not stand in opposition to his holiness or his justice. The compassion of God does not stand in opposition to the transcendence of God, the righteousness of God, but the two go together. And, and the promise for us this morning, the promise of the gospel is that this holy, just, righteous God who pronounced judgment upon this world in which we live, who, who pronounced the suffering that, that this world is now currently going through, this holy, just, and righteous God is so full of mercy, so full of compassion, so full of grace that he has provided a sacrifice for us, that he has sent the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head, to restore us to himself, to reverse the curse. You've heard this before, but Romans chapter 5, you can pull this, 5, 8, you can pull this idea out of it that God, God doesn't love us because Christ died for us. Christ died for us because God loves us, right? And that sounds like a simple thing, but it, the implications of that are huge because one of them says that, that God merely just kind of uh, made us lovable through sending Christ. The other one says that, that God saved us because he already set his love upon us. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the message this morning is that the second Adam that came into the world, Jesus Christ, who came in to undo everything that Adam did in the garden, to fulfill the covenant that Adam broke, to resist the temptation. In Matthew chapter 4 in the wilderness, when Jesus is resist, resisting the temptation of Satan, guess what he's doing? He's undoing what Adam did in Genesis chapter 3. To resist the temptation, to live the perfect life, to fulfill all the covenants, to fulfill all righteousness on behalf of all of those who would put their faith in him as the seed of the woman. As the seed of the woman. That, that as we celebrate this Christmas season, the coming of the Savior, we're, we're celebrating the coming of the promised one. And when was he promised? He was promised at the very beginning of the story. God didn't wait until the New Testament to show his mercy. And there's two responses in this room this morning. One response is, is the person that, that is sitting here today and you haven't trusted in Christ, guess what? You're still under the curse. Jesus said you're already condemned. That you are a child of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God has mercy and he gives a promise. And the promise is that if you will, if you will cast yourself at the feet of the promised one, if you will call out to Christ to save you, he will save you. Nobody has ever come to Christ that he told no to. It's never happened. Jesus said that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will no wise cast out. The promise this morning of Genesis 3.15 for you who are not in Christ is that the promised one has come and that his victory can be your victory. His life can be your life. His death can be your death. If you want Jesus today, you can have him. And the promise to the one that is in Christ I've been increasingly made aware, and I believe it's, um, I believe the Lord's just been putting this in my heart. I've been incre increasingly made, made aware over the last several weeks um, that, man, there are people, there are people among us that know the Lord and love the Lord and are doing their best to walk with him, but the collateral damage of Genesis 3, the pain of Genesis 3, has been bearing down on you almost more than you can stand. There, there are people that, that walk through these halls and, and serve for us and do all these things for us that I, I look at week after week and I just think, man, they've got it all together. They're walking with the Lord and I have no idea how much pain is in their lives right now. Whether it's pain caused by suffering out of anybody's control or pain caused by relationships, pain caused by other people. The pain that finds its root, that finds its source in Genesis chapter 3. There are some of you, brothers and sisters, in this room this morning that are feeling that. And you need to know, you need to know that the, the pain is not without a promise. That his grace is sufficient for you this morning. That, that as Eric has said before, that when you can't trace his hand, you can trust his heart. And his heart in this passage this morning for you is, is mercy. Listen, he gave mercy to covenant breakers in the garden. And if you are in Christ this morning, you're not a covenant breaker. You're counted as a covenant keeper. 
how much more will his grace abound to you? Hold fast. Continue on in the faith, as Brett mentioned this morning. You who are in Christ, who are trying to keep your head above water, his grace is sufficient for this morning. The word for you this morning is not judgment. The word for you this morning is mercy. And he delights in showing that mercy. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your great mercy. We do thank you for your great kindness. You are slow to anger and abounding in love, Lord. I pray that the kindness and severity that you display in this passage and in the rest of your word would would touch our hearts this morning. For the one that needs to see the severity, I pray that it would lead them to repentance. I pray that it would lead them to the cross. I pray, pray that it would lead them to your son, Jesus. And for the one that needs to see the kindness, I pray that their heart would be strengthened. I pray that it would be encouraged. I pray that they would know, Lord, that your word, Psalm chapter 1, says that the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Lord, I pray this brother and sister hears this morning that you know their way, that they are seen, that they are not forsaken, and that your grace is sufficient for them, Lord, and that they, they just need to hold out, Lord. They need to hold out and hope in your great mercy. Thank you for this time this morning, Lord. Thank you again for your word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.